Welcome to Let's Ask a Theologian, a gospel center program where we interview evangelical scholars and theologians for the equipping of the saints. I am your co-host, Joshua Olivares, with Jonathan Olivares. And on today's program, we'll be discussing textual criticism and the reliability of the New Testament documents. Have you ever considered on how reliable the New Testament documents are? Or possibly you've been wondering, how can we be sure that the copies can be trusted? Well, today our theologian and guest is no stranger to this type of discipline. Matter of fact, our theologian for today is a highly respected Greek New Testament scholar who is the executive director of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts and has served as senior research professor of New Testament studies at Dallas Theological Seminary where he has taught there for more than 32 years. And as to his academic pilgrimage, he received his BA at Biola University and earned both his THM and PhD at the Dallas Theological Seminary and has done postdoctoral studies in various prestige universities. He has also written, co-authored, and edited several books, such as Reinventing Jesus, a reader's lexicon of the apostolic fathers revisiting the corruption of the new testament and his notable greek grammar beyond the basics and he is also the senior new testament editor of the net bible and so without further ado let us welcome our theologian for today dr daniel b wallace dr wallace it is a pleasure and honor to have you on the program with us today well, thank you, Joshua and Jonathan. I'm delighted to be here. Praise God. Praise God. And uh, yeah, again, we would like to extend our gratitude to the Lord God Almighty for your life, Dr. Wallace, as he has used you as a tremendous blessing to us and the entire body of Christ. So to God be the glory. So Dr. Wallace, um, before we get started, we'd like to know first, uh, as, uh, as a way of introduction, how did you come? To know the Lord. Well, I I was a believer when I was uh, became a believer when I was four years old, but uh, I didn't have nearly as strong a commitment to the Lord until I was sixteen. Mm. Uh, I was actually the president of the high school group. Uh, before that time, I lived a, a, a pretty ethical life. My parents were believers. My whole family, on both well, both my mom's and dad's sides, both of them were believers. So I grew up in a Christian home. When I was uh, 16 years old, I went to uh, a Dave Wilkerson rally at Melody Land in Anaheim, California. It was at that time a country western uh, venue and later became a, a charismatic church, I understand. But uh, I was having girlfriend problems mm. and uh, that always causes you to start reflecting on some of the metaphysical realities of, of the world and life and things. So. <laughs> I uh, went to this rally, and uh, when the uh, preacher called for people to come forward, I was uh, fairly upset at what he was saying. Mm. I was upset because he was saying you have to give up cigarettes uh, to become saved and this kind of thing. So I was going to give him a piece of my mind. Now, there were 5,000 people at this uh, event, and about, I don't know, hundreds came forward. Yeah. As I got up out of my seat, uh, the Spirit of God changed my heart right wow. then. Wow. And uh, no longer was I going down there to give him a piece of my mind. Instead, what I was doing was going to really commit my life to Christ. Amen. And so I get all the way down there. And, you know, as I said, hundreds of people were, were on this uh, circular um, stage. And uh, he comes up to me first with microphone in hand, and he says, young man, why did you come here today? And so I'm glad the Spirit got a hold of my uh, my heart before I, I used my tongue in some <laughs> pretty bad ways. But I said, I'm here to recommit my life to Christ. And it was on that day, January 6th, 1969, that I celebrate as my spiritual birthday, even though I knew it was you know 12 years earlier. But it's on that day that I committed not only uh, to, to, to you know, I guess, rededicate my life to Christ or whatever you might want to call it, but I, I committed myself to full-time Christian vocational ministry. 
Mm-hmm. And from that point on, that's all I prepared for. I, I come from a family uh, on both sides of inventors and uh, professors and um, really, really smart people, especially in engineering. My dad was a, a great engineer and uh, his grandfather, uh, his father invented what's called the drafting machine, which is how all blueprints were done in the 20th century till computer aided design. And I was supposed to pick up on some of those things. I have no skill on that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do machines. I can barely screw in a light bulb, (laughs) but I went in an entirely different direction. And I'm just glad I married a woman who does know how to screw in a light bulb, but a bunch of other things that I'm clueless on. So that's a a long time story, but that's, that's when I really, really decided living for Christ is all that matters. Mm -hmm. And right after that, uh, that spring semester, this happened at the very beginning of the spring semester, I uh, began to read through my New Testament every week. And uh, I, it, it, I'm a slow reader. I underline everything. And that's why I've had to buy a lot of books from Dallas Seminary because I forget that they're the library books. And I underline them. And so I've, I've bought a lot of books that the seminary owned and finally decided, I'm just going to buy my own and, and <laughs> Um, underlined. So I've got about an 8,000 book library. Wow. Um, but uh, every single week I'm reading through, it's taking me 30, 40 hours. And during that semester, I I met a man. I grew up in, in Newport Beach, California. That's where I, I, I were, always wear my uh, rain spinner Hawaiian shirts. But uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the surf sucks in Dallas, you know, so I'm just, it's kind of my roots. <laughs> but uh, I met a man at a real estate office, solo uh, real estate office, and he had a big billboard over the the office that said, Jesus saves. So I thought, well, this must be my kind of guy. And so um, I I talked to him and I found out that I could buy today's English version or good news for modern man. If I bought a whole box load from him, I don't have to pay 25 cents per copy, paperback copies. And uh, I don't have any natural... Um, outgoingness, I guess you could say. I'm, I'm naturally very, very shy, and in fact, painfully so. But the Lord gave me some, just some, some. I'm, I'm searching for the words. I'm, I'm an old guy, so I can't remember all the words. But I was, the Lord gave me some boldness that is not naturally mine. Yeah. And so I started driving up and down Coast Highway, picking up uh, hitchhikers sharing the gospel with them, giving them one of these New Testaments. And then every few weeks, I'd go back and see this guy, uh, Brother Michael, I think is what he called himself. Well, he was no brother. <laughs> he was an Aryan. Oh, he, he, Yeah, and uh, he was not a Jehovah's Witness, uh, witness but he, he didn't believe in the deity of Christ. Wow. And so he was showing me places in the New Testament where he was claiming this shows that Jesus is not God. Mm. Well, that caused a major crisis for me and gave me an awful lot of direction for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I decided if, if I'm going to commit my life to Christ, I better make sure he's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And so that put me on a course to learn Greek. And so when I went to college, I got four years of Greek, eight eight semesters of it, went to seminary. I got another 14 courses, seven years of of Greek and, and, you know, post-grad studies in Chivingen and Cambridge. Um, Athens, places like that. So, but it's always been about who Christ is. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's the heart of, you know, scripture points to him. So it's, this is a long explanation about my conversion and really being sold out for the Lord. Mm. Um, it's been a wonderful ride 55 years ago as of last month. Wow. Praise God. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Wallace. And again, it has benefited many uh, mm-hmm. in the body of Christ. Now, Dr. Wallace, you mentioned because of your study and discipline in uh, in Greek, uh, as being the executive director of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, uh, could you kindly share with our audience uh, what this organization is about? First of all, it's going to be a mouthful for people to remember, but you can go to our website, csntm.org, and here's the way to remember the website. You, probably your listeners would know who C.S. Lewis is. Mm-hmm. So you got the first two letters. And at least the older listeners will have seen The Wizard of Oz, and they know who Auntie M is, <laughs> C.S. Auntie M. And if they remember that, they'll, they'll be able to get there. 
that organization started in 2002 and it started uh, I, I founded it then because of digital photography that was just coming into its own and i i found it uh, to begin to digitize greek new testament manuscripts what i realized at the time and it's, it had been a preoccupation of mine since 1971 to actually think about the manuscripts and, and look at the best images of them most of them the vast majority of them were on microfilm and most of those microfilms are pretty bad mm. in fact a, a fourth of the microfilm images that we have of our greek new testament manuscripts can't even they're not even legible so something had to be done if we're going to base our faith on the word of god we need to know what the original said as much as we possibly can right and so our institute csntm was the first institute to digitally photograph Greek New Testament manuscripts yeah. with a, a state-of-the-art four megapixel camera, <laughs> four, yeah. not 44. And uh, we've grown in the last 22 years so that now we use 150 megapixel cameras uh, and each image is nearly one gigabyte. Mm. So it's a far cry from the early days. Yeah. And we've, we've digitized more Greek New Testament manuscripts than any other place on earth, uh, including the Vatican and British Library and Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, you know. So we've, Tiny Institute, we've got eight full-time employees, but that's our initial purpose. Our ultimate goal is to be used by others to uh, help produce the best critical editions or scholarly editions of the Greek New Testament, which then become the basis for translation into all modern languages. Yeah. So in a very real sense, CSNTM is standing at the head of the stream of all future Bible translations. It's remarkable how the Lord has blessed us. Amen. Wow, praise God. And again, that CN, um, the center of uh, the study for the New Testament manuscripts has become also a great blessing to those who want to get into the actual manuscripts themselves. And again, we thank God for that, for His providence. And because of this, Dr. Wallace, the next question is, since you have worked uh, in the field of textual criticism for a very long time, uh, for someone who is not aware of the term textual criticism, could you kindly explain to us what this means? When Christians hear the word criticism, they can bristle at times, thinking this means you're being, uh, you're being critical of the Bible. Well, there is such a thing as biblical criticism, and what that means is the scholarly examination of the Bible. Textual criticism is, is generic for, uh, it, it means the, the scholarly uh, examination of a particular text. It, it, for every ancient text that was obviously handwritten, we, we don't have the originals of any literary text from the ancient world. We do have a private correspondence and some minor things that are not they don't rise to the level of literature but uh even uh lincoln's gettysburg address we don't have the actual envelope if that's what he wrote it on mm. uh, anymore so it's been reconstructed from what reporters said that day and from uh, five copies that his uh, his close associates wrote but they're all different and and what the newspapers reported uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting into details. You, you have to stop me at these points. But I, I'm, I'm a detail person. I don't see the big picture very well, but I'm a detail person. So anyway, uh, but anyway, we have to even do that with Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. So textual criticism means the academic or scholarly study of a particular text whose original is either lost mm -hmm. or it's uh, destroyed. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the New Testament, we can uh, say, I think, without any doubt, that the, the original manuscripts of these uh, 27 books uh, are, are, they fell apart within a century of, of uh, having been read. They were copied so much, read so much. They were the lifeblood of the church and people were hungry to know who Jesus is. And so they, you know, they were all written on papyrus, which was kind of ancient paper. It's far, far sturdier than, than modern paper, but also a little harder to write on. So yeah. all the originals were written on, on uh, parchment. I mean, papyrus instead of parchment, animal skins. Mm, thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. And for most people, you know, they walk into a Christian bookstore and they pick out the Bible of their choice based on color, but they have no 
<laughs> Not even based on translation. Don't say that when I'm drinking water. <laughs> Um, not not even based on the translation, just based on the color. Right. Um, and and they don't know, you know, how they got their Bibles. And and, and we we even here have like our in house seminary with the church, uh, and we ask them, do you know how you got your Bible? Um, do you, you know, as, as you were going through that journey too, to know if this if Christ is the real deal, then I have to know that He's real, and um, not just in my heart, but proven through his word. So could you kindly walk us through the process of getting to where we are today, where we have 66 books and, and how can we know that what we have is exactly what God wanted us to have? Yeah. That's a large question. that will go far <laughs> beyond this, this uh, particular podcast, but let me try to summarize just the new Testament portion yes. of that. The old Testament is a different uh, animal, but, uh, the New Testament portion, you you have Jesus' stamp of approval on what the apostles are going to write. Uh, and uh, the, the Gospels, of course, it, it's called canonization. Uh, the Old Testament canon, the New Testament canon, that canon means a standard or a rule or a guideline that's inviolable, really, that the canon of, of Scripture is the rules by which we know what belongs in there, and it also refers to what actually belongs in there. Mm -hmm. But the canon of the New Testament is actually Jesus Christ himself. Yes. And once we recognize that, then he is the standard by which we measure everything. Amen. And the ancient church looked at, uh, we, we've been able to discern three specific guidelines that the ancient church followed uh, in the uh, first four centuries, first uh, yeah, first four centuries to think through uh, what belonged in the New Testament, and I want to make a very very careful distinction here. The ancient church did not determine what goes into the New Testament. The ancient church discovered what the Holy Spirit had inspired, yes. and that goes into the New Testament. It's a very important distinction, and it really is the distinction between how Roman Catholics deal with canonicity and how Protestants do. Right. Catholics would say the church determined it, and therefore then the church is an authority over the New Testament. Well, you know, then you're in a vicious cycle. Who gives them that authority? But that's why Catholics have a tough time saying that the scripture is the, the, our highest authority. It's, it's underneath the church in some respects, underneath tradition. For Protestants, uh, one of the things that we recognize is that there was no universal ancient council that said these are the books of the new testament mm -hmm. so there was no official stamp that said these are the books as if some kind of a church or ecclesiastical uh, council was able to, to say this is what we determined to be the scripture it was something that grew naturally but there are three criteria that the ancient church used the first was apostolicity and we, we've discovered this by reading what these church fathers have said. Apostolicity means either, and we're dealing just with the New Testament, of course, yep. the book is either written by an apostle or an associate of an apostle. Yes. Yeah. So that rules out anything from the second century on. Mm -hmm. And when you hear about somebody saying, well, the Gospel of Thomas, that might be considered uh, part of the New Testament canon, there's this group, the Jesus Seminar, that had a book called The Five Gospels, and they threw Thomas in there. Well, nobody thinks it's first century except some really weird people that are a minority. Uh, brilliant scholars, but they're hardly yeah, getting much traction. Um, the Gospel of Thomas, anything from the second century would be thrown out by those. Apostolicity is the first and major criterion. Is it written by an apostle or an associate of an apostle? Even the anonymous Hebrews, we would say this was written by at least an associate of an apostle because it mimics so much of what Paul writes. And in chapter 13, he speaks about Timothy coming to them from Italy after he'd been uh, in prison for a couple of years. Well, Timothy was an associate of Paul. So we, we get the sense that this was, uh, it, 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 it fulfills the checklist, apostolicity. Mm -hmm. The second one, is Catholicity, and that is not Catholicity in terms of Roman Catholicism, but was this book accepted by the churches? Mm -hmm. Now, 
uh, it was, this is something that, uh, there were two levels of this, and, and uh, Eusebius, who wrote Church History in the 4th century, about AD 324, when he completed these books, he wrote in uh, uh, Church History 3.25 that there's four ways that he viewed these ancient texts. And uh, Eusebius, this was his, his lifelong fetish, if you will, to trace in the annals of, of the uh, first century church on, uh, carefully document what the church said about these books. Mm -hmm. And he had four different categories. One is called homologumina, mm -hmm. and that's a technical term in Eusebius. It means it's accepted by all the churches mm -hmm. unanimously. And from the first century on, trace it through the, the five major uh, churches that were the big churches in the ancient world. Um, and uh, so I guess we had five mega churches back then. But <laughs> so the second um, uh, group was called the Antimogomena. And what that meant for Eusebius is these are books that are not accepted by all these churches, but they are accepted by the majority of churches. Mm -hmm. So those two categories uh, fulfill the, the criterion of uh, Catholicity. In other words, they're accepted by the majority or by all the churches. That checks that list off. And then uh, the third category was uh, pseudepigrapha, mm -hmm. which, uh, as you might guess from its name, means it's a forgery. It's written by somebody who is other than what is claimed for the book. Yeah. And the ancient church universally threw those out. When they knew something was a forgery, it didn't even have a chance to, to finish the race. So there's no way they're going to say this is part of the canon. Mm -hmm. And then the final category is apocrypha, those things that are hidden books. And by that, Eusebius didn't mean the Old Testament apocrypha that the Catholics believe in, but apocrypha means things that are hidden. And it had to do with various weird books. Like, uh, there's a number of things that we might call both pseudepigrapha and apocryphal works. But if you want to read some of these ancient fairy tales about Jesus, uh, these things are just absolutely bizarre. Mm -hmm. um, so the two first two categories are what he said, this is what belongs in the New Testament. And I think the third, well, the third category of usage here, by the way, I hope you're going to cut out some of these. Uh, now you have to cut out some of these places where I go off. off Not the at rails. all. No, we're enjoying it. We're enjoying it. You're going to just put this all on the way it is? Oh, man, I'm done with this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the last criterion for discovering what was um, the New Testament was orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Does it conform to those books that we already have accepted because we know they are orthodox? And the Gospels, we know in the second century there was a growing canon consciousness. It's not that when, when these uh, New Testament writers wrote those books, they send it off and they say, man, I just contributed to the Bible. I've got another book that's scripture that belongs to the Bible, one of the 66. No, no, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think any of them, except perhaps John writing Revelation, knew that they were writing scripture. Mm -hmm. They were inspired by the Spirit, but they weren't uh, inspired in such a way that it was a verbal dictation. We don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. The Spirit of God guided them. They used their own words. Even prophets used their own words. Uh, but uh, uh, they, except for prophecy, these writers did not get a sense that they are being um, led by the Spirit uh, for something that would have eternal or um, uh, long-term long uh, value. I should say eternal value because the Scripture is eternal in its value. So, when Paul writes 1 Corinthians, for example, chapter 1, he says, I'm, I'm glad I did baptize many of you because I came to preach the gospel. And he says, oh, I baptized these guys. Oh, yeah, and I forgot about these guys. Well, if Paul is thinking, I'm writing scripture, he's telling, you know, he's, he's dictating to a scribe. And he's saying, oh, darn, I made a mistake. I'm writing scripture. We've got to rip that sheet out and start again. What scripture is, is 100% divine yes is a hundred percent divine product and a hundred percent human product mm -hmm. and you you see a glimpse of the humanity of these authors when you recognize this dance between the divine and the human and it's i mean the the holy spirit did not um 
move beyond what that person's capabilities or personality is like. Uh, for example, Hosea has a vocabulary of about 500 words. I mean, it's, it's a minimal, almost country bumpkin kind of vocabulary. And <laughs> Isaiah is on the opposite end. He, he had a vocabulary that was probably closer to 30,000 words from what we can tell just from the book of Isaiah. He, he was the Shakespeare of the ancient world, really. Mm. So both of these authors are guided by the Spirit using their own personalities and their own explanations. And yet, when the dust is settled, we look back and say, this is the word of God, and every word is the word of God. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the word of man, and every word is the word of God. So uh, it's, we have this model already in the person of Jesus Christ, the incarnate word of God. He is 100% divine and 100% human. And we have that same kind of a thing with scripture. So that was a long side tour on something that I didn't know I was going to be asked. <laughs> Super edifying. Yes, and thank you for answering that. I'm sure that many of our uh, viewers will say, wow, I, I didn't know that. Um, but, you know, as, as your best friend, Bart Ehrman, had written uh, in his... He is my friend, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I've known him for 42 years. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's, he's a friend. Yeah. Uh, Interesting so, character. It, it, go ahead. In his book, Misquoting Jesus, he says that it's impossible to really know uh, what the apostles intended to say for we don't have originals we only have copies of copies and copies and 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 even then the christian wonders why are there so many copies and why should this encourage us um what should we know about these copies do they tell us that we actually have the word of god if we don't have the originals in our hands yes, you're asking kind of a multifaceted uh, question and since I'm an old fart, I might forget parts of it so you can remind me as I sure. talk about some of these. Well, first of all, I would say about the copies. Uh, in 1713, a scholar at Cambridge University, Richard Bentley, mm -hmm. uh, wrote that he, he said he was defending a work done six years earlier by John Mill of Oxford University. Mm -hmm. Now, this is early 1700s. And Mill had produced, he, he spent his, his entire adult life working on one book as, as a scholar for 30 years. He's working on one book, and that was to gather all the evidence he had access to, to write down what the differences are among the manuscripts, mm -hmm. because there's no two manuscripts that are exactly alike. Uh, what the differences are among the manuscripts, the, the versions, ancient translations, he knew several languages, and what the church fathers have to say. So he produces this massive volume that has footnotes or an apparatus that's uh, frequently longer than the text is. So you have the text of, here's what was published in 1516, essentially 200 years earlier. But he said, there's a lot of differences among the manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being 30,000 differences that he found. Now, he looked at 99 Greek New Testament manuscripts. Uh, now, what happened is two weeks to the day after that work was published by John Mill, he died. Perfect time to go. I want to go two weeks right after I write my magnum opus so I don't have to deal with the critics. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep bumping my, my computer. <laughs> That's going to make your, your, your viewers seasick. I think. So um, John Mill didn't have to deal with his critics. But what happened was after he wrote this, this uh, massive volume, uh, there were there was glee among Roman Catholics, and there were very far right wing Protestants yep. uh, that uh, were upset about it. The Catholics were saying, "Look, you guys have a paper pope, and he disagrees with himself. Does he say what's above the uh, the line? You know, the, uh, is it the text or is it the footnotes? Because all those footnotes are giving the, the variations from what that early text was, uh, and these." Far right wing Christians were saying, uh, Protestants were saying, uh, John Mill, you've done the work of the devil. Mm -hmm. Well, I can say without equivocation that doing serious historical work is never the work of the devil. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the things I would argue is that the Christian faith, we might say even the, the Jewish Christian uh, faith, 
the Bible is the only sacred text of any major religion that subjects itself to historical verifiability. Right. It puts it, itself on the on the desk of the critic to examine it and come to their own decisions about it. Mm -hmm. now, I mean, when you read about uh, Jesus being raised from the dead, it doesn't just say he was raised from the dead somewhere in the ancient world or even somewhere in Israel. He was outside the gates of Jerusalem, and it was on this date, and, and you know, he rose on the third day. We, we know about the eyewitnesses. Uh, we know about uh, when this happened. Uh, and we, uh, even Paul, shortly after he became a Christian, he interviewed a number of these uh, eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Yep. What, when, when the Lord rose from the dead and the tomb was opened, it wasn't to let him out. It was to let the disciples in to see mm -hmm. that uh, he was no longer there. Jesus Christ subjects himself to historical investigation. When you start looking at the Bhagavad Gita or the teachings of the Compassion uh, Buddha or the Gospel of Thomas or these other apocryphal works, what you're discovering is they don't talk about names and places and people and events and and uh, put this in a in a full blown historical context. Or the Quran either, just mm -hmm. a bunch of sayings. The Gospel of Thomas, for example, does not mention a single place. It does not mention anybody except just a few of these disciples. And uh, it, it doesn't mention any miracles. Uh, it doesn't uh, subject itself to historical verification. Now, there's a reason why that is. And that is these books that started to rise in the second century and later, that at the end of the Gospel of Thomas that we have, we only have one full copy. It's in, in Coptic language. Um, at the end of it says the Gospel according to Thomas. Well, when you look at, if you were to look at the originals of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, what we would say there is uh, they were anonymous. And yet the early church knew that these were the authors. So you get this impulse among early Christian groups or sub-Christian groups to get immediate credibility by adding the name of an apostle or a well-known Christian as the purported author. And if Gospel of Thomas is coming on the scene late, how are we going to get that to, to be accepted? Well, let's put a name of an apostle on it. We don't have that with the scriptures in the same way. So what I'd say is, uh, uh, now, now I got lost. Where, where were we? I told you I was old. So what, what's, <laughs> bring me back to the question you were asking about this. Yeah, so what, um, I guess, understanding or encouragement should the Christian get in knowing that we have data as you said, it's yeah. on the desk, open for anyone to yeah. analyze. I, I, I remember I was getting sidetracked, but a very important sidetrack about the incarnation gives us the methodological imperative to do serious historical research in the Bible. That's what I wanted to get at. Mm -hmm. But uh, when it comes to the copies, we have no two copies that are exactly alike. In fact, our two closest ones from the first eight centuries have between six and ten differences per chapter. Yeah. You extrapolate that out over the whole New Testament, if they were complete New Testaments, that'd be a couple thousand differences. Mm -hmm. And those would be the two closest in the first 800 years. Mm -hmm. So when we start looking at uh, these copies, not only do we have differences among them, but we don't have the originals. So because of the disappearance of the originals and the differences among the copies, we have to do textual criticism. Right. We have to compare manuscripts with manuscripts. And Richard Bentley came to the defense of John Mill six years after Mill died. And he said, would we be in a better condition then when, if we only had one manuscript uh, to, to uh, get back to the original text with? He was talking about Erasmus, mm -hmm. who in 1516 published the first Greek New Testament. And Erasmus based it on eight manuscripts. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Uh, he said, having more brings more certainty about what the original is because we can begin to compare these manuscripts. Yeah. And you can see very common errors. The, the, the kinds of mistakes that scribes make are almost always going to identify what that is. It's, oh, it's, uh, they wrote a word twice or they skipped a word because it was like another word in a different line. Um, spelling differences, nonsense readings are the absolute most common of these variants. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so we, if, if, if I, I like to give this as an illustration. If I had 100 people in a room and I just started reading something to them and asking them to write down what I wrote, what I said, I could collect all those papers and it would take me probably a couple of weeks but without having the document that I wrote. In fact, anybody could do this. Somebody who understands how scribal work happens, they could reconstruct virtually word for word, if not exactly word for word, what I had said, mm. even though all the manuscripts are corrupt. Mm-hmm. Well, now you have this spread out over centuries. And uh, since uh, Richard Bentley's and John Mill's time, we've found many manuscripts that are earlier than that. Uh, the King James New Testament was based essentially on Erasmus's eight manuscripts, the oldest uh, one of which is uh, from uh, the uh, uh, 11th century. So it's just a maximum of 600 years older mm-hmm. than when the King James was published. And that was the one that Erasmus used the least, which was actually the best manuscript he had, but he, he didn't think it was that good. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, we have well over 5,000, I'd say well over 5,500 mm-hmm. Greek New Testament manuscripts and another fifteen to 20,000 of ancient translations. Uh, and you, you put all that together, and we have hundreds of thousands of variants. But the thing is that with all those variants, with all those manuscripts, we have greater certainty, and we can recover pretty darn exactly the wording of the original. Exactly. So let me, let me follow up on, on Bart Ehrman in Misquoting Jesus. He was asked at one point uh, if, if he and his professor, Dr. Bruce Metzger, a very fine conservative uh, Christian scholar, uh, were locked in a room and they could not leave until they both uh, hammered out what the Greek New Testament original looked like. And they listed all their variants, all the differences between the two of them. Bart said it would be no more than about 50 places where we disagreed. Mm. 50 places. So you read misquoting Jesus and you get the sense that everything is up in the air. We can't possibly tell what the original is. And yet, uh, when you see his academic work and some other things, you realize, no, uh, he actually thinks we can get, get pretty close. Mm-hmm. And uh, are you familiar with the, the paperback uh, edition of uh, uh, misquoting Jesus? And that one came out about three months after the hardbound copy did. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, when the hardbound copy came out in the first three months it th- sold about 100,000 copies uh, it was uh, I think perched at number one on the Amazon list shortly after Bart Ehrman was on John Stewart's The Daily Show oh. and uh, he was interviewed about Miss Corey Jesus mm-hmm. and Stewart says that's a hell of a book <laughs> that's not something you normally call for a book about the Bible but that's what he called it <laughs> But uh, so then it shot up to number one and after the sales, they wanted to keep the sales going, so the, the publisher wanted to add an appendix. This is only in the paperback version, and it's page 252 of the appendix, where these editors are asking Ehrman, uh, why do you believe that essential beliefs of the Christian faith are in jeopardy because of these textual variants? Why do you disagree with your professor, uh, Dr. Metzger, on this point? And Ehrman's response, same page, 252, is, is uh, remarkable because it's the pointed question that is getting asked. He said, oh, no, I don't agree with that. The, uh, the, uh, orthodoxy, um, essential beliefs of the Christian faith are not affected by the textual variants in our manuscripts. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not the impression you get reading through the book, but when he's point blank asked that, all of a sudden, oh, well, this is... Uh, um, it's a different different thing altogether. Mm-hmm. So you've got hundreds of thousands of college kids who have come from Christian homes and have just abandoned the Christian faith because of this book and other writings that are kind of arguing the same thing. Mm-hmm. And yet, if they read the appendix and realized, oh, that's what he's really saying, well, then what's really at stake? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Wow. No, thank you for, for sharing that, Dr. Wallace. And I guess one thing that we would want to ask from you concerning about differences or variances, what you had mentioned earlier, 
what can we say to brothers and sisters in Christ who might be watching this and uh, in their mind as they're reading certain texts such as the last ending of Mark or John chapter 7, uh, verse 53 and following? You've picked um, two of the far and away, the, these are uh, Mark 16 and John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Those are the biggest textual grants we have in all of our manuscripts. Yeah. Uh, each one is uh, 16, 9 through 20 for Mark. It's 12 verses long for each. The next longest variant we have is two verses. And we have a grand total of 15 variants, I believe, that are either one or two verses. After that, it gets into parts of verses. And far and away, the most common variant is spelling differences or nonsense readings. Right. And that accounts for about 70% of our variants. Uh, so we're, you're picking some really dramatic examples here. Uh, Revelation 13, 18, we'll deal with that in just a second. But let's, let's start with uh, the story of the woman caught in adultery. Yeah. Uh, I, I would consider that to be my favorite passage, and it's not in the Bible. Mm. I, I believe it is not part of the original text of John's Gospel. Uh, but uh, we have, through the first eight centuries, I think we have one manuscript that has that uh, story in it if i'm not mistaken codex uh, d it's early fifth century but it's in a quite different form from what we get in the later manuscripts now uh, there's about 20 percent of all of our greek new testament manuscripts that don't have that story in them why is that if it's if it's so well known and so well loved by um christians for centuries why would these earlier manuscripts especially not have it? Right. Well, that's a question that, that we have to wrestle with. I would say that if we can examine why we want a passage in the Bible, that helps us to understand what's really at stake. And let me just ask the question, is this the only passage where we see the Lord Jesus forgive somebody? Mm, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Of course not. Mm -hmm. And is it the only passage where he... Um, essentially condemns the Pharisees and their attitudes? No, we see that all over the place in the Gospels. There's nothing in this except the specific story of the woman caught in adultery that really uh, draws us in, and uh, that, that makes it something that we want to have. I would call, uh, it's called the Pericope Adultery in, in Latin, or the story of the woman caught in adultery. Uh, I would say that we have emotional baggage in this. That we want it to be in our Bibles. Yep. And we're not the only ones who want it to be in our Bibles. It's in three different places in John 7. Not just that one place, John 7, 53 through 8, 11. It's, it, it, and sometimes you have just one or two manuscripts. Sometimes you have a whole group of manuscripts. It's also found after Luke 21, 38. Mm -hmm. And in, it has more characteristics that come close to Luke's writing style than it does to John's. And uh, I think, well, I, I won't get into this. I'll just throw this teaser out. That if it, if it uh, I, I think that a part of this story may have been something that Luke had access to, not the full story as it's as it's uh, found in our Bibles now, but it, but it wasn't exactly the woman kind of adultery. She's caught in some sin, and there's some things that we can lift out that are probably apocryphal some things that seem to be historical but uh i'd say luke probably had access to it and he would have put it after luke twenty one thirty eight. but it just didn't rise to the level either of historical reliability or i think i think what he had it was reliable but uh it it uh it wasn't as interesting as some of the other stories he likes to have unnamed people women in his gospel he does some other things but we, we have so we have this emotional baggage that goes with it it's also found between luke and john and it's found after john as just a loose loose uh, passage this is a passage that tried to get in the bible and it made it in later centuries mm -hmm. the uh there's uh so so when you see a text that is floating in different locations, that is perhaps a sign that it is not original, it's not authentic. And to float even outside of John's gospel is pretty significant. You even have Papias, 
an early church father who's writing uh, no later than 120. And he remembers a story of a woman caught in adultery. And uh, it's not exactly the story. But what he says is it's found in the gospel to the Hebrews. Now, Papias claims to have been a follower of John the Apostle, and it, it, he may have been a disciple of John directly. Uh, he may have been a second-generation disciple, but Papias is a really important early, early writer. He knows John's gospel, and yet he says this is from the gospel to the Hebrews. Well, either he's uh, made a very grave error that is inconceivable because he knew what belonged to what gospels, right. or else it's not exactly the same story. Mm. And uh, so uh, there's emotional baggage with that. Now, when you look at the Mark 16 passage, verses 9 through 20, what's interesting there is you have uh, Eusebius and uh, Jerome in the early and late 4th century who are saying this passage is found in very few manuscripts. Uh, but... Uh, most gospels end at what we would call verse eight. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's where Eusebius said, this is the end of, he, he, the word in Greek is he canonized the end of, gospel, uh, of the gospel to verse eight. And what that means actually is that this is what he considered to be scripture and this edition, which he found in very few manuscripts in the fourth century. And Jerome, same thing. It's significant that all of a sudden it's found in almost every Greek manuscript we have now. In the fourth century, we have two manuscripts, and it's not in either one of those. Mm. So that's a, the ending of Mark's gospel has far greater credibility to it than the story of the woman caught in adultery. If I had to choose one of those two to go in my Bible on the basis of the available evidence, slam dunk, it's the long ending of Mark 16. If I had to choose which one of those I want in my Bible, there's no question, it's John 8. Mm -hmm. So we have to base our faith on evidence. Christian faith is grounded in history and yet shrouded in mystery. And that's a dance that we have to think about as we work with uh, these ancient arguments from a position of faith. Wow, praise God. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Wallace. And, you know, so, some, some, some of them might be watching this and they're saying, Man, I wish I had the faith of uh, Dr. Wallace. Um, but has there ever been a time in your life, um, especially in the discipline and the field that you're in, where when you're looking at these variants, where it actually caused you to possibly doubt if the Christian scriptures are in fact reliable? And if so, um, what encouragement did the Lord give you to overcome that type of intellectual obstacle? That's a really good question. I don't think anybody's asked me that before, believe it or not. Uh, I have been asked, has there been a time in your life uh, once you made this commitment to Christ where you had some doubts? And as I mentioned, when I was talking to this Aryan, I had doubts about who Jesus was. I really wanted to make sure my faith was on, on a solid basis. Mm -hmm. And there was a time in my own doctoral program where I was having, I was struggling with the uh, historical reliability about the resurrection. And uh, I had to recognize that it's an event that happened in history, but it is so unusual that if you hold to naturalism, you have to deny it. Yeah. Yeah. But if you, have a, if you are more open to an open universe uh, that uh, you don't have, you know, it's not a closed universe of just natural events, then the evidence for it is absolutely overwhelming. One scholar 120 years ago said the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is, is stronger than just about anything from the ancient Greco-Roman world mm. of something that uh, happened. So I had struggles with that. That lasted about two weeks. Uh, but I, I had to work through things. You know, and I, I'm, I try to be a sympathetic reader of, of what I examine, ancient literature, modern literature. And there are things that, that I do have questions about, but at bottom, I don't think it affects the core of my beliefs, and, and here's why. It's something that I learned uh, after, several years after I, I graduated from my master's uh, program in 1979, and that is that we need to have a doctrinal taxonomy. 
what that means is the Christian faith needs to make a distinction between what are the things that are essential to believe, what are those things that are more peripheral, and uh, make sure that we don't uh, put front load the peripherals to say, if this is not true, then I won't believe in the essentials. Now, there's two different ways in which doctrine is constructed by, by uh, conservative Christians. One is what I call the domino view of doctrine. That is, if one falls down, the rest fall down. And what happens is you get way too many Christians who front load that first domino is the doctrine of inerrancy. Mm -hmm. And so if that one falls down, and often it, it gets chipped away when they get into doctoral programs, not because there's errors in the Bible, but because they're getting one side of those issues. And uh, as uh, D.A. Carson said, uh, Christians in, in secular doctrine programs have to work twice as hard as the others because they believe the Bible is the Word of God. Yeah. And so they have to not only study what the professors say, but see what others have said on the other side. Uh, but uh, if we front load it with inerrancy, then we've got a problem because if we think we've found an error in the Bible, we throw everything out. That's exactly what happened to Bart Ehrman mm. in, the, in the introduction to his misquoting Jesus. He said when he was in his uh, MDiv program at Princeton, he was trying to defend inerrancy. He did a, a paper for um, a professor uh, on the Gospel of Mark. He was taking the Gospel of Mark from him. And it was dealing with when Abiathar was high priest in Mark 2.26. And that's what Jesus says. When Abiathar was high priest, that's when David went into the house of God and ate the showbread. Well, you look at 1 Samuel 21, and it's not when Abiathar was high priest, it's when his father Ahimelech was priest. Mm -hmm. So did Jesus make a mistake? Did Peter make a mistake in remembering it? Did Mark make a mistake in writing it down? There's a textual variant. Maybe the scribes got it all wrong. There's a lot of ways to slice this. Maybe our interpretation is wrong. Right. But what happened to Ehrman is he got through this. He said he, he was really trying to defend that there's no mistake there. And his professor, who was a conservative professor, said, maybe Mark just made a mistake. And Ehrman's whole theology crumbled in two pages in this quote in Jesus. And then he goes on a couple of paragraphs later and says, maybe Jesus was just human after all. So I'd say that was a brittle fundamentalism that he had. Mm -hmm. And it, was, it had the basis of inerrancy, which should not be our fundamental belief. There are many people who are Christians who don't hold to inerrancy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's many who don't even hold to what is called infallibility. Inerrancy means the way I would define it: the Bible is true in what it touches, what it deals with. Uh, uh, but there's some nuance in there that I won't get into. Infallibility means the Bible is true in what it teaches, mm -hmm. and I think that one we can very easily claim: this is the view that Jesus had of Scripture, and uh, I, I think I can demonstrate that through historical critical means to say Jesus' view of Scripture was different from the Pharisees, different from the Sadducees, and he believed that the Word of God was infallible. And my view is the safest place for me to be when it comes to how I view the Bible is right next to Jesus. I don't want to be anywhere else. Amen. So Now, I do hold to inerrancy, but my core doctrine, my, my foundation of everything is the death and bodily resurrection of the theanthropic person and a death that uh, pays for our sins yeah. if we put our faith in him. That's the core. Everything else is built on top of that. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And um, having now mentioned about Jesus, Dr. Wallace, um, did you have any? Yeah. Um, I, we were talking about that Revelation 13 passage and it'd be. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah if you could maybe <laughs> touch on that. Okay. Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, speaks about the number of the beast. It's the only place in the Bible where the number of the beast or the Antichrist is actually given. And it says, and his number is 666. It's the number of a man, or that might mean the number of mankind. What's interesting is we think of the perfect number as seven. Everybody says that. in the Bible, perfection is number seven. Well, uh, do you all know what gematria means? Have you heard of that? Yeah. It's it's a, a way to convert 
uh, letters into numbers, like Arabic numbers didn't exist in the first century. And so in the Greek New Testament, when they want to write a number, they'll put it in a letter. And th there was a convention. They said alpha means one and, you know, yoda means 10 and things like this. And so they, they were able to write these letters and put a line over it to say, don't read this as a word. It's actually uh, a number. So the number 777, which is what we, you know, if, if you had a gematria for Jesus, the name Jesus, if I were God, I'd give him the number 777 because he's perfection over and over and over again. That's not the gematria for Jesus, though. Mm. The number for, of, of uh, Jesus is 888. Oh. And uh, I, when I found that, I said, oh, that's really interesting. Because when did Jesus rise from the dead? On the first day of a new week or the eighth day of mm -hmm. the week? Wow. And 2 Corinthians 5, behold, all things are new, and we've come into our Sabbath rest. And, uh, you know, Hebrews talks about that. You've got some others that talk about uh, how everything is new with Christ. And it's how I view it is it's beyond perfection. Mm -hmm. As uh, one scholar said, just as there are 88 keys on a piano, there are 88 names uh, and titles for Jesus. And just as you can get uh, an infinite number of tunes out of those 88 keys, there's an infinite number of prisms through which you can see the Lord Jesus, and it'll never exhaust him. Mm -hmm. So that's that gematria. 666, on the other hand, if you have 0.666 and you want to get two-thirds, it never ends. If you want to get an absolute perfection of two-thirds, you can't. Just like, how do you, what, what is pi? Well, it goes on ad infinitum. It's just that we can't see a pattern in it. 666, six, six, it's the same one. But it's man's attempt to get close to perfection, and he stopped short because even his greatest deeds don't get there. Mm -hmm. Now, that might be why John wrote 666, six, six, if he did. But maybe he wrote something else. The, um, the number for Nero, the gematria for Nero Kaiser or Nero Caesar, is 616. Mm. And there was this myth in the first century of Nero Rita Vivas that Nero would uh, come back to life. And you got this idea in Revelation that, you know, one, one of the heads is uh, he comes back to life. And uh, 616 fits that name, that gematria for Nero Caesar, Nero Caesar is 616. To get 666, you have to add another N at the end of the name Nero. So it's Nero and Kaiser. That gives us 666. Here's the interesting thing. Almost all the manuscripts have 666 here. But in 1843 and 44, a German scholar studying at the National Library of France in Paris was looking at a manuscript whose text, a very large manuscript, it originally had the whole Bible in Greek. Uh, and it had all of that text was scraped off and then there was something else written on top of it at a diagonal uh, to have a manuscript that's been scraped off and written over on top of that's called a palimpsest it's it's like you remember in grade school you, you you thank god for that big eraser because you have to erase everything and then you write something else on top of it how do you read what's underneath mm. well these scribes who worked on parchment manuscripts sometimes they were very very good just eliminated any uh, hint of what was beneath it. Well, this was a manuscript that uh, Constantine Tischendorf spent two years examining and reconstructing that original text from probably right around 8400, the early 400s. And uh, it's uh, called Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus. Mm -hmm. When he came to Revelation 13, 18, he saw as plain as day, the number of the beast is 616. Mm -hmm. Now, that manuscript has become the second most valuable manuscript for giving us the wording of the original of Revelation of all the manuscripts we have. Uh, and so there's times when it disagrees with the first most valuable one, and we follow the readings of the framing rescriptus and its companions. Well, that was the only script manuscript we knew of at the time. Uh, Irenaeus in the late second century though speaks about uh, the number of the beast. He has a whole chapter on it. And uh, he talks about is the number of the beast 666 or 616. And his opinion is it's 666 because the earlier copies had that. But 
how could he tell which ones were earlier? Uh, right. The ones that probably were more worn, they don't have dates on them. Mm -hmm. So people may have preferred these other manuscripts. But until 1998, we only knew of one manuscript and we knew of Irenaeus's statement. 1998, Oxford University in conjunction with the Egypt Exploration Society published 17 New Testament papyri, very, very old papyri. And uh, uh, it was a large cache of papyri to publish. Uh, our New Testaments were originally, as I said, written on papyrus. And the earliest copies for the first three centuries were all on papyrus. Uh, there was a, a manuscript that's from the third century. And it's 26 almost postage stamp size fragments that are spread out over nine chapters for Revelation. It's from the third century. For Revelation 13, 18, it has that verse. You know, it's a big postage stamp is, is it. But uh, uh, it, uh, it's, it's the oldest manuscript we have for Revelation 13, 18. So it has, for the number of the beast, 616, mm. like Ephraim Rescriptus does. So we got two manuscripts in a comment by Irenaeus. Does that mean that's what the original said? There's some names that I think, yeah, that, that may well be the original. And there's reason I, I've gone too far into too much detail on this, but let me just leave it at that. Some days I think, ah, 616, that's the original. Some days I think it's 666. That's how I wake up everybody, you know, thinking about the number of the beast. <laughs> I'm sure everybody does that. So most scholars today would still say, well, 666, that's the number of the beast. And 616, that's, that's the neighbor of the beast. He knows a couple doors down, you know. So, uh, But here's the thing. Whether it's 666 or 616, how important is it? Yeah, I don't know of a single Bible college, denomination, church. There's probably some really far out, right wing, weird fundamentalist churches that have this, but um, I haven't come across any yet. Any seminary, any doctrinal statement that's been published where they have, we believe in the virgin birth of Christ. We believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. We believe in the Trinity, yada, yada, yada. And we believe that the number of the beast is 666. It's important, but it does not rise to the level of importance that even gets into a very lengthy doctrinal statement. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. it's the thing where you say, oh, well, man, I don't know what the Bible says now. Well, what's, what's at stake here? Exactly. I'd say two tons of popular Christian literature is at stake, but that doesn't mean <laughs> what we're really dealing with as far as what Scripture says is, is at stake. Yeah. You know, I, I re we really appreciate how you emphasize it all centering around the Lord Jesus Christ and Him really holding it all together. Because even for Christians, uh, uh, temptation to our flesh is to doubt the inerrancy um, and, and look to the thousands and thousands of variants, and but yet you've emphasized time and time again that those variants don't stain the, mm, the central message of what yes. God is trying to get across in Scripture. And so what can you say then? If I like that wording, it doesn't stain the essential message. I'll, I'll use it. I'm going to plagiarize and use your <laughs> statement, John. <laughs> Sounds good. Awesome. Um, at least Dan Wallace is <laughs> using it. Um, but what can you say to our viewers that, you know, uh, the Bible is clear despite the many differences? Because, again, there are those who say, well, if God is going to speak, why doesn't he just throughout time give us a clear message? And why do we have to wait to a, uh, for a period like the 15th, 16th, cent 17th century where textual critics start rising and it becomes a thing? Why can't God just give us a clear word? Um, I guess I'm asking many questions here, you know, but I'd say he has, he yeah. has given us a clear word. Right. Uh, if you look at uh, j just as an illustration, you look at the Greek manuscripts behind the King James and modern translations, you know, based on essentially eight manuscripts that goes back to Erasmus's text 100 years earlier versus ours, where we have access to 5,500 manuscripts. The oldest one for the King James goes back six centuries. Ours today, some of which go back all the way to the second century, small fragments, but right. they go back that far. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, there's not a single doctrinal statement that I know of any church or denomination, there may be some, that has changed 
in the last 500 years because of all these new discoveries. Exactly. It, it, it's, it changes the interpretation of a given passage. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change the essential belief or the essential truths that Scripture is teaching. So I think my advice is that there are those who are skeptics who will try to make uh, chicken littles out of believers. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to not panic and think through really what's at stake. And I, I've read some who say, well, you know, for examples of textual problems, take Mark 16 or John 8, uh, typical examples, so call it. They're atypical as anything could ever be because mm. they're, you know, six times longer than the next longest textual variant. And so, you know, you get these kinds of things where the idea that some Christians have is, well, if we can't trust it here or here, what other passages do we have to just throw out? Yeah. And, and it can scare them. Mm. But the thing that Christians need to do is say, all truth is God's truth, and I am not afraid to examine the data. And I'm not afraid to listen to both sides. Yep. Don't listen to the siren songs of the anonymous internet uh, proclaimers of, of truth, but do your homework. Yeah. Uh, read, read the best scholars on, on both sides. Yeah. And uh, I think you come to the conclusion that uh, the Bible is true and G Jesus Christ is indeed um, the king of the Jews and the king of the world and the king of the universe. Amen. Praise God. And now, Dr. Wallace, as we wrap things up, uh, for all the things that you mentioned that was definitely so edifying for us, for someone who might be watching right now who is unsaved, what is the gospel? The gospel is very, very clear. The whole Bible is focused on human beings trusting God and how we have failed at that. I believe, but help my unbelief, the father of the little boy uh, said, and uh, you've got the Jews, you look at the Exodus and, and the ancient history of, of, the, uh, of Israel, and they constantly are failing and not trusting God. The Bible is not about what can we do to get saved. The Bible is about who should we trust to be saved. That's right, that's the Bible is not about what we do, but what he has done. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between Christianity and anything that claims to be Christianity. It's two letters, do or done. What Jesus has done or what we think we can do. There's absolutely nothing we can do to get ourselves saved because uh, we are simple people and uh, you have to have perfection to get into God's presence. Yes, yes. You can't stand sin in his presence. Mm. The only one who has lived a perfect sinless life is Jesus Christ. And when he was raised from the dead, that's God the Father's stamp of approval on Jesus' death for us. And consequently, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, not just faith that he died and rose again, but a personal trust in him, it has both a, a belief component and a personal relationship component, we are saved. Mm -hmm. So put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ who died for you, the Jesus Christ who was bodily raised from the dead, the Jesus Christ who pays for your sins when you put your faith in him. That's how we get saved. That's the gospel. Praise God. Well, Dr. Dan Wallace, thank you so much for uh, explaining to us and our viewers concerning about our topic for today. And for those who might be watching, we pray and hope that you may not only have come just to an understanding and knowledge of textual criticism and the reliability of the New Testament documents, but most importantly, to who Jesus Christ is. He is a powerful Savior. And if we will repent of our sins and bow the knee to him, as what Dr. Wallace had already mentioned, he will forgive us and he will save us. Well, we thank you for joining us on this program. Let's Ask a Theologian with Dr. Dan Wallace. I'm your co-host, Joshua Olivares, with Jonathan Olivares. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord bless you. And always remember that Jesus Christ is God. <laughs>